the ability to impact your life more than anything else on this planet. And so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to look at an overview of the Bible. So before we dive into it, each and every week where we're looking up close at what it says, we need an overview of what it's about and what does it mean. Because the reality is if we don't have an overview of the Bible, if we just open it and we turn to some random verse and we read it, he trains my hands for battle, my arms can bend and bow, bow of bronze. It's like if we just open that, it's like what does that mean? Does that mean that like I'm going to be really strong and ready for battle? It's like if we have no context for what the Bible is, then we're not going to be able to get the most out of it as we dive in and look really, really deeply at what it is. And so I'll never forget my first summer that I came to Kaleo. And this book came alive to me for the very first time. And my life looks incredibly different than it did before I got up close and personal and studied the words that were in this page, or on these pages. And so that's my hope, that's my prayer for you guys this summer, is that this book would come alive to you this summer. That you wouldn't look at it as just words that are on a page, but these are the words for life. These are words from God himself. And so tonight we're going to look at, hey, an overview of the Bible. Because if you want to get the most out of spending time in this book this summer, we need to have a good understanding. We need to have a 50,000 foot view of what's in it and what it's about. And so um, the first thing we're going to look at, there's going to be four things that I think will inspire us to go deep, to spend time in this book, and to enjoy every second of it this summer. And so the first one is who? Who is the main author of the Bible. And so we see 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, it says, and we also thank God constantly for this, that you re- when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. And so the Bible is God's powerful word to us that works in us. It's God's powerful word to us that works in us. When we read the words that are on this page, this is God speaking directly to us. This is his voice. This is how God directly communicates with us. I hear people all the time that say, hey, I want to hear God speak to me. I want him to say something to me. He has, and they're on these words that we have in the scriptures. When we read this, we get to hear God's voice. He's speaking directly to us. When we study in the summer, as you're having your quiet times, As you're diving in each uh, week when you're at Bible study training, looking up the different verses, looking up what it says on these different topics, this is God speaking directly to you this summer. And so the reality is, for most of my life, when I opened this book, I did not view it that way. I viewed it as this random collection of words that people wrote and put in a book. And And therefore, it carried no weight in my life. But the Bible tells us through different scriptures that God inspired it. The word that it uses is God breathed out every single word that is on this page. He used men to put it together, but the Bible tells us that they were carried along every step of the way and that God inspired every single word that's written in this book. And so every word that we read in this book, it's directly from God. And so when we read it, we get to hear his voice. And when we view it as that, when we view it as God speaking directly to us, as God's voice, that changes the way that we read the Bible. We don't view it as just a textbook or a philosophy book or a rule book. It has so much more meaning and value when we understand who the author of this book is. Have you ever, have you ever experienced God working in your life? God using his word to transform something in your life? Like, God is powerful. His word is powerful. When you view the words on these pages with the weight that they really have, it'll transform every aspect of your life. God's word, he's speaking directly to us. When we remember the author, it carries so much more weight. So we've got to remember the author every time that we read this book. And so with the people that are around you, um, go ahead and discuss, hey, do you, have you ever viewed the Bible as being able to hear from God? And so do that and say, how would it, and then answer the question, how would it change how you read the Bible if every time you opened it, you viewed it as getting to listen to what God has to say to you? And so we've discussed those two questions with the people that are around you.
every time we open this book, we have the chance to meet and hear from God himself. And so we have to remember who the author is. The set. So that's who. The second thing is what? Is what is the Bible about? What's the main theme that goes all throughout the Bible? And so most of us, we see the Bible as just this random collection of things that are in here. But the reality is that the Bible has one story from start to finish. It's one story from beginning to end. The Bible is one story from the beginning to end following one pattern all throughout the scriptures. And so that pattern is its creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. All right, say it out loud as I say it. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. When you remember that theme as you're reading all throughout this book, it's going to transform the way that you read each and every story. See, without knowing that main theme, that main pattern, that main story throughout Scripture, you'll read parts of the Bible and you'll just say, what on earth? is the same. But when you have a big picture, when you have the 50,000 view of the story of the Bible, everything begins to make sense. Everything begins to come to life. And so the first thing that we see is creation. In the very first chapter of the Bible, what does it say? The very first verse. In the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so that's creation. We see all through Genesis 1 that God creates the heavens and the earth. God creates man in his own image. And so God creates everything that's in the world. And so we see that in Genesis 1. Not long after, less than two pages later, uh, we have uh, the fall. And so the fall is Adam and Eve, whenever they took the fruit, God said, hey, you can eat from every tree in the garden except from this one. And what did Adam and Eve do? They disobeyed. And so they sinned, and that's what we call the fall. And so when they sinned, their relationship with God was separated. They had to leave the presence of God because God being perfect could not be with people that were disobedient, that were imperfect. Perfection and imperfection cannot go together. And so they had to leave the presence of God. And so it doesn't take long. That's less than three pages in and everything's already gone wrong. But the beauty is it doesn't end there. We have the rest of the scriptures where we get to see see the story of redemption come to life. And so uh, redemption, it's, hey, how does a holy God who is perfect, how can we imperfect people have a relationship with him? And so that's the story of redemption. And so this story of redemption in Genesis 12, we see that God picks Abraham. He says, hey, Abraham, I'm going to make a covenant with him. I'm going to make a one-way promise to Abraham. And he tells Abraham, I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, as the sand on the shore. And all nations are going to be blessed through Abraham's family. And so he makes that promise to Abraham. And the rest of the Old Testament is Abraham's lineage, is God being faithful through and through each story to play out this story of redemption. But God's people, they're not great at listening to the uh, guidance that he gives them. And so God's people, they're always disobedient. God will perform a miraculous miracle. He'll split a sea where millions of people can walk across. And then not long after that, they build, they build an idol worshiping someone else. And so uh, they have to, there has to be a system where they can still have this restora- or redemption with God. And so they come up with a sacrificial system. And so all throughout the Old Testament, you'll see the Israelites, that becomes the lineage of the God's people that he makes that were descendants of Abraham. The Israelites have this system where they have to have sacrifices that they make to have right standing before God. And so they have sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice that they have to make with these animals because they keep disobeying, they keep turning away from God himself. And so the story of redemption plays out, but these these people, they do it imperfectly. And so there has to be something better that happens. And so eventually God raises up a king, King David. And he says, and the Israelites, they want a king, and they have King David. And he says that the Messiah one day will come, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, is going to sit on the throne. And what we see in the beginning of Matthew is that we have this system where these the Israelites, they can't do it right. They keep turning their back and going against what God says. But God says, hey, I know in spite of you not being able to do it, 
I'm going to make a way. I've made a promise. I'm going to make a way that you can do it. And that's where we see Jesus. And if you open up to Matthew 1, you see a genealogy. It's like some of you have probably tried to read Matthew before. And it's like, why is there this list of names? That's the first thing that I read in Matthew. Isn't there like more important things than just this list of this person, the son of this person, the son of this person? It's like, what can all this mean? And you see it starts with Abraham, it goes through David, and it leads to Jesus. Who God made this promise to Abraham that he was going to bless all people through him, that he made a covenant with him. And we get to see that come to fruition in Jesus, who's the perfect sacrifice. Where they had these sacrifices after sacrifices just to cover the sins that Israel kept making. Jesus lived a perfect life and was the perfect sacrifice where we didn't need any more. And that's the story of redemption. It's God's plan to redeem his people. And so we see redemption all throughout the scripture. When you read the Old Testament and you see just the story of redemption play through, it makes so much more sense when you read the story of these Israelites and how God is pointing them to one day when they'll see Jesus. The whole Old Testament points to Jesus. Every story, whenever you read stories in the Old Testament and you see that, it comes to life so much more. In Abraham, uh, the story of Abraham, uh, who, is, who God made the covenant with, there's one day where he asked him to sacrifice his son. And so he's willing to take his son and sacrifice because God has asked him to. And so right before he's about to sacrifice his son because God has asked him to, there's a lamb that comes. And God says, hey, take the lamb and sacrifice the lamb instead. And so he does that. And the, uh, whenever Jesus gets on the scene, one of the prophets had to come before and says, behold, the lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. And so we see a passage all the way in the Old Testament that's pointing directly to Jesus. The whole Old Testament points to Jesus and the story of redemption of his love for his people. And so we see uh, redemption. And so the whole Old Testament is pointing to Jesus. We get to see the New Testament, which is the story of Jesus' life. And so a lot of the New Testament is about Jesus and pointing to Jesus, or it's pointing towards restoration. And so one day, uh, in the world now, you, I'm sure you realize our world is broken. It can't be how God has designed the world to be. You just look around and it's full of heartache, it's full of sorrow, it's full of brokenness. But one day the world's going to be restored to how God had originally designed it. And so you flip to the very end of the Bible, to Revelation 21, and it says this, and I heard dress, or, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will, uh, will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And so we see the, New Te or the Old Testament, how when Adam and Eve sin in the fall, they're separated from God's presence. But we see in restoration... That one day, there will be a day where we'll be with God in his presence. And everything will be restored. And so when you see this theme throughout the scriptures, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, everything makes so much more sense. It's one story front to back. And the amazing part is that we can see those four things in our own lives. I'm sure a lot of you have seen God's redemptive work in your own life. You've seen ways that he's redeemed parts of your life, ways that you were able to have a relationship with him. He's redeeming parts of your life. You get to see these four things play out in your own life. And so God has a big story, and we get to play a part in that story, which is amazing. So when we see and we read the Bible, and we have that lens of it being one story, everything makes so much more sense. The whole New Testament either looks back at redemption and how we live in light of it or moving forward towards this beauty of restoration. The central person of the Bible is Jesus. It's either pointing towards him, it's either telling about him, or it's saying how do we live in response of him, waiting for the day that he'll return and we'll get to live in the restored world. And so go ahead with the people that are around you, discuss the questions. Have you ever seen this theme uh, through scripture as you've read it before? And how does knowing the major theme of the Bible from front to back impact how we read um, the different books that are in the Bible?
So it's one story following one pattern throughout the scriptures. So what's the pattern? What do we start with? Creation. Creation. Fall. Redemption. Restoration. What I love about that is it gives incredible hope. Like whenever we realize that one day, like everything will be restored to perfection, that gives incredible hope. And so that's why I love getting to dive in and see just the theme of scripture, because it gives more hope than anything else that we can put our hope in. So we looked at the who, who's the main author, that God is the main author of the scriptures. We looked at what, what is the Bible about? So now we're going to look at how. And so how is the Bible structured? So if it's one story following one pattern, it's obviously not, it's structured really uniquely in that it's, com it's made of 66 different books. And so there's 66 different books in the Bible, and there's different types of writing. There's different types of writing all throughout the Bible. There's history, there's law, songs, wisdom, um, parables, poetry, genealogy. There's so many different types of writing that are all throughout the Bible. And so some of the books that are written are just giving a historical account of what's happening in that time. If you open and read the book of Joshua, what you're going to read in the book of Joshua is a historical account of what's happening to the Israelites during that time. Now, if you open the book of Proverbs, the Proverbs is not a history book. The Proverbs is a book of wisdom. And so you have to read it with that lens. And so there's one narrative where you can follow the whole narrative in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so I'll send out a picture um, in the group me that's really helpful to kind of understand the different types of books that there are and how they play out through the scriptures. Because there's a historical narrative that we can follow in the Old and the New Testament. But then in that, there's different books that are written at different periods of time throughout that. And so as you're reading these different books, it helps to know, hey, where do they fit in in this grand story that God has from beginning to end of the book? And so there's 66 total books, different types of books. Um, and so in the Old Testament, this, this will be on your sheet, there's different types of books in the Old Testament. And so five of the books are the books of Moses. So these are books that Moses wrote, books of uh, these are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. First five books of your Old Testament. These are books of Moses. Then there's 12 historical books. So these 12 books are following the historical account of the Israelites throughout the Old Testament. So we have the historical books. There's five books of wisdom. And so the five books of wisdom, that's your Proverbs. And so these are wisdom literature that we have in the Bible. So they're not history, but they are to give wisdom. And then we have minor prophets and major prophets. And so five minor prophets, or five major prophets, 12 minor prophets. And so what the prophets were, they were people that fit in the narrative, in the historical times of these Israelites, that God had given specific words to give to his people. And so if you open up the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was a prophet. And so he lived in the time of those 12 historical books. And so even though Jeremiah is after some of the books, his, like what he was saying happened in the context of those 12 historical books that we see. So he fits in that historical narrative that God had given him specific words to give to his people. And so whenever you know, hey, what period of time did Jeremiah write to? Who was he writing to during a certain period of the historical context? It makes so much more sense the words that he's saying when you understand what the Israelites were going through historically in that time. And so that's the Old Testament. There's 39 total books in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, we have five books of the Gospel and Acts. And so these are kind of the historical books of the New Testament. So they're over, the Gospels are over the life of Jesus. The book of Acts is over the apostles and the beginning of the church. And so these are stories and accounts of that time. Then we have 13 of Paul's letters. And so these are 13 letters that the apostle Paul wrote. And so if you open up and read the book of Romans, Romans is not a letter to Roman. It's a, look, it's a guy named Roman. It's not written by a guy named Roman. It's Paul writing to this church in Rome. And so it's titled the book of Romans. So it's really a letter that Paul had written to this church that was in Rome. And so there's 13 of Paul's letters. So 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. That's a letter that Paul is writing to Timothy. And so when you have a, a context of, hey, what are these books about? Who's writing them? They make so much more sense when you read them. And then there's nine general letters. And so these are letters in the New Testament that are not written by Paul. So they're written by other people 
that are by Paul. And so every are other people besides Paul. And so every book that you read in the Bible, what you can do is you can, a lot of Bibles will actually have kind of a context page on who wrote it, what it's about, what is it fitting in this grand narrative of scripture. And so you can get some context uh, for what the book is about. And so that's super helpful to, under, to understanding kind of what these specific books mean and how they fit into the one story that God is writing. And so that's the how in how the Bible is structured. But I think most importantly is the why. It's why spend time in God's word. I think the most important thing is that when we realize that these are words that are written by God and it's God speaking to us, that's, that's the biggest why that we could ever have. That, hey, these are the words that God's given us. But besides that, why should we spend time in God's word? The Bible is God's powerful word to us that works in us. The Bible has amazing abilities to transform and impact different things in our life. That nothing else on this uh, earth has the ability to do. One of my favorite verses is Hebrews 4.12. It says, for the word of God is alive and active. It's living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. That it can penetrate your heart. That it can judge the thoughts and actions of your heart. There's no other book on the planet that when you open it, can uh, tell you the thoughts and actions of your heart. That when you read a verse, you identify, hey, this is, these are my thoughts and actions. This is what I'm thinking. The Bible has so many different descriptions of itself. And so we're going to go through some of these different descriptions. Uh, and so Hebrews 4, 12, it's described as a sword. God's word is alive and it can change us. It affects and impacts our lives. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 12, it's described um, as milk. It describes it as spiritual milk. And so what he's saying when he describes it as milk is that it's easy for someone that's first starting out to be able to understand when an infant is growing, it's what do they need to have strong bones? What do they need to grow? They need milk. And so it descri- the Bible describes itself as milk. That when you're first starting out, when you're first starting to grow in your faith, this book has the ability to help you grow. But it's not just described as milk. It's described as solid food. Hebrews 5, 12 through 15. That it's not just for the infants. That for all of your life, that it's solid food. It can help you mature and grow. When you're 20... You don't want milk anymore. You want a steak. And so this is solid food. This has the ability to continue to help you mature for the rest of your life. Jeremiah 23, 29, it describes it as a fire and a hammer. A fire and a hammer. That it can purify and break into pieces. It has the ability to change our lives, to break down different thoughts and things that we had before and purify our lives. What other book has the ability to do that? James 1, 23 through 25, it describes it as a mirror. It says that God's word, it's like a mirror when you look at it, that it reflects and show us, shows us how we look. When you read the Bible, it shows us what we look like in our heart. It reveals our true selves. That when we get in God's word and we read it, he speaks to us. It has the ability to show us our true selves. Most of my life was built around of just putting on different facades for people. But God's word's a mirror that when I read the words on this page, it cuts to the heart. It's alive and active, and I come face to face with who I really am. First Peter 1, 23, it describes it as seed that is sown. It brings forth life. God's word gives life to those who receive it. Psalm 119, 105, it says it's a lamp and a light. A lamp and a light that it shows us how to walk the path of life. It illuminates and shows us what it looks like to follow Christ. If you want to know what it looks like to follow Christ, the answer is in this book. Ephesians 5, 25 and 26, it describes it as water. It's the necessary source of life. In the context of where this was written in the Middle East, it's a dry, dry climate. Water is the most important thing in that time. It's necessary for life. Psalm 119, 9 through 10, it's first, it describes it as gold. It says that the Bible is more desirable, it's more valuable than gold. 
It's the most valuable thing that we can ever have in our lives is this book. That same verse, it describes it as honey. It says it's sweeter than honey, than, than honey straight from the honeycomb. The sweetest thing that we'll ever have in our lives is in this book. And then lastly, Hebrews 6, 18 through 19. It describes it as an anchor. In our lives that can, just so much can happen in our lives. It's turbulent. There's just lots of hardship that we can have in our life. There's lots of things that can go wrong. There's lots of things that can go great, but the Bible, it anchors us. It helps, it keeps us from wavering from the story that God is writing in our lives. It's an anchor. I love the descriptions that the Bible has about itself because it's alive and active. This book can do far more than anything else in our lives. And so my challenge for you guys this summer is spend time in this book. Spend time hearing from God this summer. And so why study the Bible this summer? If you want to know God, if you want to grow in your relationship with God, this is where it's found. If you want to know God, if you want to grow in your relationship with God, there's nothing better than you can do with this summer than give time to studying and knowing this book. Because every time you open, every time you sit down, every time you read the words that are on this page, you're getting to hear from God himself. There's lots of amazing trainings, lots of content that you'll get to do at Cleo this summer, but there's, there's no better content than words directly from God himself. It doesn't get any better than this book. This summer, most of our training is going to be involved with diving in and seeing what this book says about different topics in your life, topics that are applicable to college students. Because even though this book was written thousands of years ago, it's as applicable to our lives today as it's been for generations and generations. This book is alive and active. And I'm excited to see the impact that it has on y'all this summer. And so go ahead with the people that are around you discuss um, these questions. Which of these descriptions of God's word stands out the most? And what excites you the most about getting to spend time hearing from God this summer? This is God's powerful word to us that works in us. It's this powerful word that works to, that, uh, to us that works in us. And so this summer, we're going to get to study it up close. And so just for application, hey, how can you get the most out of t your time at Kaleo this summer? And I want to challenge you to this, is commit to hearing from God every day this summer. That every day you're here this summer, spend time in this book. Spend time hearing from God. All of y'all got a quiet, a time alone with God journal. And so it's called time alone with God because it's time for you to specifically be able to spend in this book hearing what God has to say. And so if you do anything this summer, it's commit to hearing from God every day this summer. And so how can you practically do that? How can you set yourself up with, for a win to do that? And so there's three things. Is one is pick a place. And so find a place that, hey, every day, I'm going to go to this place, and I'm going to open this book, and I'm going to hear and read what God has to say to me. And so first, it's a place. Second is a time. Find a consistent time that each day that you can spend time hearing from God. Maybe it's before work. Maybe it's depending on what time you used to be at work. Maybe it's right when you get back. But find a consistent time each day that you can spend hearing from God this summer. And then the last one is listen to what God is teaching you. When you're spending time in this book, the Bible promises that his word does not return void. That if we're spending time in this book, it doesn't return void. And so listen to what God is teaching you this summer. And if you do that, 
I promise you, it'll be the most amazing thing that you'll do in your life if you let this book shape everything about you. And so let me pray for us, and then we're going to take a 15-minute break. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've given us a direction. You've given us a light, a lamp, that it's sweeter than honey, that it's more desirable than gold, that your word's alive and active. I pray that every time that we open this book this summer, that we would realize that it's words that are directly from you. And God, I pray that that would carry weight in our lives. Um, God, I pray that we wouldn't just hear the words, um, but we would be doers, that we would apply what we're learning to our lives, that we would let this book shape our lives. Here, my pray. Amen.